Have you ever wondered what is the common thing between a SpaceX Starship rocket and a skydiver? Well, obviously, they are both super cool, but also physics. Both, while in free fall, can control their movement by changing the shape of their bodies. The Starship rocket has four small fins it uses for control, while skydivers manage their movement by adjusting the position of their arms and legs. So both change their shape to steer themselves while falling. I decided to design and build a robot that can do the same. And in this video, we are going to cover every step of the project, from the initial idea and design, all the way to the final result, where the robot takes flight. We will also talk about the challenges I faced along the way and how I solved them. This project has a lot of complex details, so we won't go into all of them. And the parts we do cover, I'll try to simplify as much as possible. So grab yourself a cup of coffee, and let's get started. To create a robot that controls its movement by changing its shape, we first need to understand what happens when an object is inside an airstream, how its shape affects that and what are the other factors that play a role. We can grasp all this through a simple physics principle, that is drag force. Drag force is the resistance an object faces when moving through gas or liquid. It's the same force you feel when you stick your hand out of a moving car window. You feel the air pushing your hand backward. In most cases, drag is unwanted force, because it makes movement harder. That is why race cars, airplanes and ships are designed to be aerodynamic, to reduce drag as much as possible. However, in our case we want the exact opposite. We need to increase drag as much as possible, because it is the force we will control to make the robot fly. Alright, the equation for the drag force can be described like this. In simple terms, without going into details, the larger the area of the object facing the air, the stronger the drag force becomes. And as the movement speed increases, the drag force also increases. One thing to note, the area we are talking about is not the object's total surface area. For instance, when this object moves in this direction, this is the area that matters. One last thing, the drag force doesn't just apply when an object is moving through the air, like a skydiver falling towards the ground. The same principle applies when an object is stationary and the air is moving around it just like how skydivers train in a wind tunnel. In our case, we won't be dropping the robot from a plane and control it as it falls, like a starship. Instead, we will make it fly inside a vertical wind tunnel. To understand how we can design the desired robot, we will start with something simple. Let's see what happens when a flat object is placed in a vertical airstream moving upwards. Since the air is moving upward, the direction of the drag force will also be upward. The simplest way to control this object is by rotating it. When it rotates, it pushes the air in a certain direction, and the drag force will act in the opposite direction, according to Newton's second law. Now let's imagine, instead of having one object, we have two connected objects, and we can rotate each one independently. We will call those objects flaps. If we rotate the flaps in opposite directions at the same angle, they'll push the air symmetrically. As a result, the drag forces on the flaps will also be symmetrical. Because of this symmetry, the total force will point upward and we can control its intensity by adjusting the flap's rotation. The more we increase the rotation angle, the weaker the vertical force becomes, and vice versa. Now we can imagine how a simple object like this could fly in a vertical airstream. In the default state, we balance the drag force with the gravity force, keeping the object floating in the air. If we want it to move upward, we increase the object's surface area by reducing the flap's angle symmetrically. This increases the drag force, making it greater than gravity pushing the object upward. If we want it to descend, we do the opposite. We reduce the surface area by increasing the flap's angles. This decreases the drag force, allowing gravity to pull the object downward. In addition to the vertical movement, we can also make the object rotate and move sideways. Instead of rotating the flaps symmetrically, we rotate them in opposite directions. This creates a difference in drag force between the two flaps. This imbalance causes the object to rotate and move horizontally. Now that we have understood the general principle in the simplified 2D case, we will apply the same idea in the more complex 3D scenario. Instead of two flaps, we will use four, positioned symmetrically around the square base at the center. This configuration allows us to control the motion in all directions by adjusting the angles of the flaps independently. In the default state, the flaps will be arranged symmetrically so that the total force point upward, balancing out gravity. Using the same principle we used in the 2D case, we can control the robot's height by adjusting the surface area. Closing all the flaps symmetrically increases the area facing the air, which increases the force and makes the robot move upward. Opening the flaps decreases the area, reducing the force, and the robot moves downward. The pitch and roll rotations can be controlled by closing two adjacent flaps and opening the other two. This creates an imbalance, causing it to rotate. We can also control the robot's CO by closing two opposite flaps while opening the other two. We now have a clear understanding of the robot's overall design and we can move on to the construction phase. The first thing we need is a source of vertical airflow, which will be a wind tunnel. And since buying one is extremely expensive, 
the only solution was to design and build the one tunnel myself. The initial design had six brushless motors and six propellers, each with a diameter of 40 cm. The motors were symmetrically arranged at the vertices of a regular hexagon. For the frame, I used aluminum profiles and 3D printed parts. Before diving into more details, I want to talk about an issue that comes up when using propellers to generate airflow. The air produced by a spinning propeller is not laminar. It tends to rotate in the same direction as the propeller, creating a vortex. To reduce vortices in the wind tunnel, the propellers shouldn't all rotate in the same direction. That is why we have three propellers rotating clockwise and the other three counterclockwise. This prevents the formation of a large vortex above the entire wind tunnel. However, there is still the issue of small vortices forming above each propeller. To reduce this problem, the clockwise spinning propellers are positioned above the counterclockwise ones, creating an overlap between their airflow areas. This not only helps with reducing the vortices, but also ensures that the propellers cover a larger area of the wind tunnel. In the initial design, I also used a metal safety grid to prevent anything from falling into the propellers while they are spinning. After some tests, there were several issues with the wind tunnel. The first problem, the airflow at the center of the wind tunnel was weak, so I added another motor in the center. Additionally, the airflow had a lot of turbulence, and small vertices were still forming. To solve this, I replaced the metal grid with an air straightener, a layer of 14cm long tubes. This layer ensures that the airflow is directly vertical, and significantly reduces both vertices and horizontal air currents. And that's how we end up with a wind tunnel capable of generating airflow speeds up to 11 meters per second. If anyone is thinking of building a wind tunnel like this, there are a few things to watch out for. Anything placed above the wind tunnel shouldn't have any screws or bolts that could loosen from the bottom surface. Due to vibrations, a screw might come loose, fall into the wind tunnel, hit a propeller spinning at a high speed, and shoot out like a bullet. Of course, this never happened to me, it's just a random thought that came to my mind. After finishing the wind tunnel, I started designing the robot. The tunnel's diameter is 1.2 meters, so the robot needs to be small enough to move freely inside it. In the first design, the robot's width was 20 centimeters. I also chose to keep the airflow speed relatively low at the beginning, just 8 meters per second. Since the robot's surface area is small, and the airflow speed isn't very high, the robot needs to be lightweight. To be able to fly under these conditions, the robot needs to weigh under 200 grams. This weight limit meant that every part of the robot had to be as light as possible. The robot's frame and flaps are 3D printed using strong lightweight material, and the flaps axis are lightweight carbon fiber rods. For the controller, I used one from a mini quadcopter called Crazy Flea, which weighs about 15 grams. To control the four flaps, I needed four motors. I tested three types of servo motors, and the KST brand turned out to be the most precise, each motor weighing about 9 grams. The servos need more than 7 volts to run, so I used two small single cell lithium batteries each weighing 10 grams. Lastly, I needed a circuit to regulate the voltage for the controller and to connect it to the servo motors, which weighs about 25 grams. By assembling all these components, the first version of the robot was ready. We have talked about the general principle of the robot and how we can control it. But if we want the robot to actually fly, we need to understand precisely what happens when we rotate a flap or multiple flaps. This is called the physical model of the robot. We already have a rough idea of this model by simplifying physical laws. However, to achieve a more accurate model, there are several approaches. One way is to take real measurements and modify our model accordingly. To do this, I connected the robot to a force and torque sensor. I placed it above the wind tunnel and measured how the forces changed when modifying the robot shape. With these measurements, I refined the physical model, which will be used for controlling the robot. To be able to control the robot, we need to know some information about it at every moment, like its position, speed, and orientation. In other words, we need to know the state of the robot. We can get this information using different sensors. For example, the robot has an IMU chip, which measures its acceleration and angular rates. As for the robot's position and orientation, we can measure them using an external tracking system, like the OptiTrack. This system uses multiple cameras distributed around the wind tunnel. It can accurately measure the robot's position using small reflective markers attached to the robot's body. These cameras emit infrared light and detect the reflection of the markers. Then the OptiTrack software processes the images from all the cameras to calculate the robot's position in real time. This data is sent to another device, which transmits it to the robot via radio. Since we are talking about radio communication, we need to address a critical issue that arises when transmitting data, and one that must be solved. Let's imagine the following scenario. There is a car driving down the road, and you are controlling it remotely. A camera tracks the car's position and sends you images, allowing you to see its location and issue control commands accordingly. In an ideal case, the images you receive would have zero delay, but in reality, whenever data is transmitted, there is always some delay. Let's assume that the delay is 5 seconds. This means that the image you are seeing in the moment does not show the car's current position. 
it shows where the car was five seconds ago. In this case, we can't simply control the car based on the image as it is. For example, if we want the car to turn at an intersection, we can't wait until we see it reaching the intersection on the screen, because in reality, it would have lasted five seconds ago. So what do we do? We do forward prediction. If the car is moving at a constant speed, the distance it covers in time t is given by the following equation. If the speed is one meter per second, then the car would have traveled five meters beyond what the image shows. This way we can estimate the real position of the car and use this information to control it more precisely. In our case, the data from the OptiTrack about the robot's position and orientation arrives with a 40 milliseconds delay. While this may seem like a short time and it might be acceptable for a ground robot, in our case, even this small delay causes significant control issues, which we need to mitigate. This is where the physical model we discussed earlier comes into play. Every time the robot receives delayed position and orientation data, it performs a forward prediction using the model, estimating its current position and orientation more accurately. The robot then uses this corrected information to calculate the appropriate control commands, ensuring that it responds accurately despite the delay. And with that, we have everything we need to start experiments and try to make the robot fly. Even though I was quite confident in my design and certain that the robot would fly, but just to be safe, I decided to attach it to a safety tether during the initial tests. And since the robot was tethered, I also connected it to an external power source to avoid constantly replacing batteries. Before attempting flight, I tested the robot's control and responsiveness without turning on the wind tunnel. Everything seemed fine. And so, we are finally here. The moment where everything comes together and we see the robot fly. Unfortunately, it didn't fly. I found some issues, so I fixed them and tried again. I kept trying different things, but I just couldn't get the robot to fly. Sometimes I even felt like it was trying to commit suicide. Eventually, I had to accept that there was a fundamental issue with that design. Even though this design worked fine in the simulation, in reality, the airflow was too turbulent for the robot to handle, making control impossible. To understand why, let's take a side view of the robot. From this perspective, the beach axis, the robot is stable. If it tilts, the airflow corrects it and restores the original orientation. But from this perspective, the roll axis, the opposite happens. If the robot tilts, the airflow pushes it even further. For the second design, I added kinks to the flaps to make the robot stable along both axes. Although this design was stable, and it could do accidental flips, controlling the beach axis was more difficult, and the design was far from good, so I needed to find a better solution. After many designs and tests, combined with deep analysis and optimization of the robot's body and flaps, I finally arrived at this design. The flaps are asymmetrical, with a kink on only one side, and to lower the center of gravity, I moved the controller and the batteries below the flaps, increasing the stability during flight. In the initial experiments, the power cables and the safety tether were making the control harder, so I switched to using batteries instead of external power. As for the safety tether, it's still there, but different. It's attached to a pulley system with a small counterweight of 15 grams. This way, when the robot flies, the weight slowly pulls the tether away from the robot, reducing interference. And now, I introduce to you, Floaty. A skydiving winged robot. Floaty draws the energy it requires to fly from the air, making it highly efficient.
This project is a part of my PhD research, supervised by Dr. Michael Mullenbach, whom I want to sincerely thank for his guidance and great support. The goal of this project was not just designing a new robot with a novel concept, but more importantly, to push the limits of what is possible. There is still a lot of work ahead, as this project will serve as a platform to test machine learning algorithms for controlling sensitive and complex systems. There are many details that I couldn't cover, because they would take too much time and might not interest everyone. At the end of the day, my goal with this video is to simplify the project's idea and to explain the steps I took to reach the final result, how we go from an idea to a design and from problems to solutions. I hope you found this video useful, and if you liked it, please leave a like or a comment, because this is the only way I will know. See you in the next one. Leaked information. Next project might involve lasers. Goodbye.